Kyle, what would okay now going into topic? What would you say is the most frustrating lie out of all the interviews that you've done and you've talked about? What would you say is the most frustrating lie that the Western media says about China that is completely untrue and is just full of rubbish? Well, it has to be Xinjiang genocide, right? The, the 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 so-called Uyghur genocide that that just simply untrue. But now it's to the point where if you dare to challenge the mainstream narrative on Xinjiang, you are a genocide denier, right? Like, of course, I'm a genocide denier because there's no genocide happening in Xinjiang. I mean, duh. Like, the, the, this is this is this is completely falsehood. But like, pushed okay, so you time. say. There's no genocide happening. So the United States media and the Western media will say, oh, there's genocide. All these Muslims are like um, getting. So give me some examples, you know, how the Muslims are actually being treated good there. What rights do they have? How many like how is it, you know, how is it that a lot of them get treated better than they do in the United States? What facts have you seen to support your argument and what things have you seen there? from your own eye that it's just the Western media lies about it. And what would you say, you know, China does better when it comes to treating Muslims than the West does? Okay, so first of all, not not everything is hunky-dory in Xinjiang, right? There, there was a security crackdown, uh, a tightening security in Xinjiang for, uh, for, 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 for many years. And this is because due to the increasing in the terrorism attacks that in Xinjiang that's, that, um, that, Basically started in in nineteen ninety, but really intensified in uh, in two thousands, especially around the time um, twenty uh, from two thousand oh nine to twenty fifteen. That that stretch of about six years, um, you know, people don't realize a lot of the social media, you know, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube used to be accessible in China. It was banned in 2009. Uh, it was specifically banned in 2009 because there was a riot happened in the Xinjiang capital, Urumqi, that left 200 people dead um, and, and over 2,000 people wounded. And, and, the, the, and the, the, the riot was instigated by a lot of the rumors that were circulated on Facebook on, on Twitter, all these social media platform that was being leveraged by this Uyghur diaspora groups supported by National Endowment for Democracy, you know, all these mm -hmm. uh, three-lettered uh, agencies and, 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 and Euro suspects in the United States. Um, and so this, that's the real reason why YouTube, Twitter, uh, Facebook, all these Western social media was banned because I, also at that, that time, U.S., State Department was weaponized these uh, social media platform. You know, they, they were also doing the uh, fostering the green revolution in, in, in Iran. You know, and 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 so so this is this is the origin of the Great Firewall of China. And 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 but Xinjiang also always had a problem um, after 1990 because um, the the, the she, uh, <clears throat> um, she, well, this this goes back to the the Cold War. During during the Cold War, um, you know, China during the late latter half of the Cold War, China was de facto inside the Western camp against the Soviet Union. So CIA actually had a listening station in Xinjiang in 1980s yeah. to to monitor the Soviet nuclear testing in the neighboring Kazakhstan, and mm -hmm. and you know, and China was building a. Um, a, a road, friendship highway or Karakoran highway that linking Xinjiang to to Pakistan. Uh, the, the the work started in the 1960s, but it got finished in 1979, just in time for the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And and you know at that time, you know CIA was deeply involved, you know, working with the Saudis and the, the Pakistan. And and for example, CIA bought a lot of Chinese made weapons uh, because the Chinese made weapons like AKs, et cetera, they're, they're, they're based upon the Soviet designs. So, so CIA, CIA wanted to hide its own footprint. So you will buy these tons of Chinese weapons and ship them to Pakistan. And, and from Pakistan, 
to distribute it to all these uh, mujahideens and send them cross border into uh, Afghanistan to fight. Mu mujahideen, another and, who was very funded by the CIA. That was a fun CIA funded group who committed yeah. a lot of atrocities against people in Afghanistan. And it, like, keep going. Yeah, Operation Cyclone. This was the biggest yeah. CIA operation yeah. before before Syrian civil war. That's when. You CIA did Operation Sycamore, which is a you know kind of just yeah. follow on. But 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 during that, um, so it was originally uh, a, 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 like a funny anecdotal story. The CIA also wanted because there's no roads in Afghanistan, so so to ship all these weapons in, do, they needed transportation. So initially, they brought in um, mules from the United States, Tennessee mules, but the mules couldn't handle. The harsh environment in Afghanistan. So all these American mules start dying in Afghanistan. So CIA ended up buying a lot of mules and donkeys from Xinjiang in China, and then sent them across the border on the Karakoram Highway into Pakistan, carrying these these Chinese-made weapons, you know, for the Mujahideens, and sent them into into um, into Afghanistan. And you know the. Not only just the goods and weapons travel on the Karakoram Highway, but people also, because in that, after 1978, uh, people start open. China start opening up. People are allowed to go travel abroad. You know, some some Uyghur people start to go out to do business. You know, they start to go to Pakistan to to re basically reviving the ancient uh, Silk Road links. Uh, but some of these young Uyghur men did end up. Um, in the madrasas along the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. Now, these madrasas were financed and funded by the Saudis, you know, specifically to indoctrinate the Afghan refugees in in, in radical, uh, in fundamentalist ideology. And some of the Uyghur young men did make them uh, their way to the camp, and then where they did get indoctrinated, and some of them went to fight in Afghanistan. And and Afghanistan, you know, Soviet will pull out of Afghanistan in 1989, and you know the the um, and then the you know the the the, the, the Afghan communist government would collapse a couple of years later. But then then in 1990, some of these Uyghur jihadists start to come back to Xinjiang. Uh, you know, in fact, before I left China, I left China in I think October 1990. But in the early part of 1990s, there was a Bahrain County incident in Xinjiang where some of these jihadists who made their way into um, Xinjiang with weapons, with their weapons, and they tried to stage attack against the local government uh, uh, installations and, and the police police uh, station, etc. So that 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 was like kind of the beginning of series of uh, terrorism attacks that would occur in Xinjiang. Uh, sporadically, but really got intensified around um, around after 2009, after the big Urumqi riots, and and then um, in fact, uh, Seymour Hirsch he wrote about the rat line where CIA worked with uh, you know other U.S. client states to funnel uh, jihadists. To Syria, you know, some of them they took from Libya, where they just had support them to overthrow Gaddafi, and mm -hmm. but one of the rat line is actually from China. Uh, you know, a lot of so 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 China started the uh, security crackdown in Xinjiang uh, in 2009 after the big Urumqi riots, and a lot of the radicalized Uyghurs start to look for ways to get out, and. There was a scheme that you uh, that, that that was worked out with the Turkish government, where some of these Uyghurs will travel. You know, now China has high speed trains; they can just jump on the high speed train and travel to southwest China. The Xinjiang border started to get locked down around 2009, but <clears throat> but not southwest China. Southwest China border was still pretty, you know, porous. So so they would jump on the train to travel from Xinjiang into Yunnan, uh, uh, China, in the, in the in, to the Kunming, and then from from Yunnan they will make their way to uh, southeastern Southeast Asia, like through Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and eventually ended up in Malaysia. And there was a scheme. Once they made to Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, they could go to the Turkish consulate, receive Turkish passport, which allowed them then to travel to fly to. To Turkey, to Istanbul, 
and at the airport in Istanbul, they will be greeted by jihadist recruiters who then would take them across the border into Syria to fight Assad. I mean, this is a well-known, uh, I mean, not very well reported, but there's one Associated Press article that reported on this movement of the Uyghur jihadists to Turkey and then from Turkey to Syria. So this is how, like, uh, in Northwest Syria today, there's still, like, thousands of Uyghur jihadist fighters settled there with their family. Um, mm -hmm. And this is also when... Um, at that time, there were um, a, a spate of terrorist, ter terrorist attacks also in, in China because China became aware of this uh, movement of, of, of radicalized Uyghurs through South Southwest. So then they tried to lock down that border. And then um, in 2014, some Uyghurs who couldn't get out, they staged the, um, the Kunming uh Kunming train station attack on March 1st. So it's really a series of terrorism attacks that prompted um, kind of the very heavy uh, security measures that was taken in Xinjiang um, uh, uh, starting from 2009. And that would, um, in 2017, uh, so that's when they started to have these uh, de-radicalization centers. Uh, that's when Chinese government felt, now there's a, there's a this is this is a this is a problem that's that's uh, that's spreading, and so they they had this deradicalization center built up all over Xinjiang. They called them, um, you know, they called them, you know, vocational schools or whatever. But they're really deradicalization centers where they will send these people to um, trying to deradicalize them. But the, all, the the end goal is always to reintegrate them back into society. So one of mm -hmm. the uh, one of the the, one of the, the function that these deradicalization center slash vocational tra training center provide is actual vocation training. So they can learn a usable skills. Once they get out, they can reintegrate into the society. Um, because it, from the Chinese perspective, because it's the Chinese government is still very like kind of Marxist uh, Leninist thinking, they think everything is economically based is ultimately about the economy and and so they need to provide jobs for people you know if people do have jobs their idea is if people have jobs they don't do terrorism so this process this this i'm not saying this is not coercive you know of course it was coercive the people will have to they have to go to direct to localization centers where they will be separated from their family for for long extended period of time but this was granted by the Western media as some sort of Auschwitz, you know, where where, where China is going to apply final solutions. As, as they were saying it was some kind of genocide and they were taking the organs yes. of the Muslims and like, yes. uh, like yes. forcing them to breed or like giving yeah, them right. injections which stop the woman from like, oh, it's, it's stupid, man. It's so stupid. It's, 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 there's a lot of, there's a lot of wild stories about China, but that, there has always been wild stories about China because I remember when I came to United States in 1990, you know, my schoolmates, you know, like in eighth grade or ninth grade, they will ask me innocently questions like, oh, I heard, you know, you know, Chinese people eat babies. <laughs> I was like, what? No, where, no. Did you, <laughs> where, where did you hear that? I mean, like, but, but you know, that's how... People get so brainwashed, you know. Like they talk about Chinese people as if they're they they are somehow all being uh you know robots, you know lobotomized uh, bots of the CPC, and and but but you, you they don't aware the other kind of propagandizing that's going on in their own society, uh in United States, for example. Uh, I mean, like like right now we're seeing what we're seeing right now is the kind of the continuation, you know kind of from the Cold War era propaganda. Because I, I remember in, even in the 1990s, the Red Scare, the Red Scare, Chinese, oh. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. I mean, in fact, the term brainwashing entered into the English lexa, lexicon from the Korean War. Because at, at that time, there were some um, uh, uh, American POWs who refused to be repatriated back to the United States. They decided to chose to go to China instead. And, and at that time, the U.S. State Department couldn't figure out why that would happen. So the, the, the explanation that came up is these people have been brainwashed 
by communist propaganda, so they turn them against us. This is how the movie Manchurian Candidate came about. You know, the, the whole idea is yeah. they will mm -hmm. they will mind control American POW, send them back to United States as agent of communism to sabotage American society. I mean, like this is. This pair, kind of paranoia kind of never went away <laughs> in the United States. I mean, I, I, I mean, underneath all that, um, uh, I mean, like 1990, I remember 1990s, 2000, when China just, you know, started to embrace market, uh, market reform and, and China yeah. started to export to and to, open to up, the US. And open up the US the world. Will, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in U.S., we'll hear about Chinese, you know, sweatshop or or or, or child labor or slave labor. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, like in, in, in Ch the Chinese miracle is fueled by many Chinese many young people, Chinese particularly young. young women, who came straight who came straight out of the farms. You know, so the, the offering opportunity to work in the big city, in the coastal cities, factories, where they can make money and send 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 it back to their family. And and I said I said before, when I lived in China in 1980s, uh, at that time Chinese population is is one billion. But even back then, 80 percent of the people live on the farm. 800 million people live on the farm. What happened in the last yeah. 40 years was this incredible urbanization uh, 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 effort oh, yeah. that happened. The incredible, the incredible story.